Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar produced by Sachs Capital Advisors. Infuse value into the biggest decision of your career, selling your business. Now, before we start, just want to give you the typical caveat that our firm is providing this information in the webinar as general guidance only, and it doesn't constitute the provision of legal advice, tax advice, accounting services, investment advice, or professional con uh, consulting of any kind. So the information provided here and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with your professionals. And of course, we include ourselves in that, that number. So before you make any decisions or take any actions, you should consult your professional advisor so that they can be provided with all the pertinent facts relevant to your particular situation. Very excited about today's agenda. Sachs Capital Advisors, we're going to talk about different phases of a selling transaction. We're going to talk about how to drive value in the sale of your business, the importance of estate planning, tax planning considerations, and the importance of clean financial statements. And you can see here, this is our team of Sachs Capital Advisors. We are the full advisory service division of Sachs LLP with the goal to offer top-notch service to all clients by acting as their number one trusted advisor. As you can see here, our skill sets and networks are broad and deep with experience in investment banking, capital markets, compliance, regulatory tax, state planning, corporate finance, and budgeting with a host of other skill sets. And here's our team right below, myself, Todd Polinak, who is your moderator today. I'm also the practice leader of the Transaction Advisory Service Practice. Jerome Fusco is the Manager Re Director of Sachs Capital Advisors. Joy Maddock, who is the co-leader of our Trust and Estates. Al Traverso, one of the a a partners functioning in uh, the Transaction Advisory Service Practice and also Steve Arenberg, who is um, everything tax in this area. So I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Jerome Fusco is gonna uh, lead off this uh, conversation. Just know folks, you can also be typing in any questions you might have in the box and we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So feel free, Jerome, take it away. Todd, thank you. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy day to join and listen to our webinar today. We truly appreciate it. So as Todd mentioned, my name is Jerome Fusco. I've recently joined Sachs Capital Advisors to continue upon the broader Sachs goal of being our client's number one trusted advisor, whether that's in accounting, uh, investment banking, wealth management, and even IT to an extent. So um, thank you all again for taking the time today. So just to really uh, level set what we're gonna be discussing, uh, you know, I've spoken with numerous owners over a number of years, and there's some typical key questions that arise, uh, you know, when thinking about a, a an actual sale. So the first that comes up often is, what is the value of my business? How does that get derived? What do people think about? How does somebody calculate that? Uh, next, actually, it's who would actually buy my company? Is it my biggest competitor down the street? Is it a rich family in California, or is it somebody in between? Um, and then another one that's very, very common is what kind of time frame am I looking at? Uh, you know, how long will this take? Is this going to take three months? Will this take three years? Uh, that question, uh, you know, has a lot of moving parts to it, and we'll discuss that later on. And finally, one not only question, but concern is how do I protect confidentiality? I don't want this getting out there. Uh, what, I, my employees might get nervous. What should I do in that respect? And that is obviously a very critical uh, standpoint. So on the next slide, for today's purposes, I illustratively broke the process out into three different phases. However, it is relatively critical to note that every situation is different and there will be a lot of overlap and moving parts. Uh, and not only are two, no two sales the same, no two sales are even closely the same and almost everyone is vastly different and it doesn't matter on the industry, the buyer or the seller, there's always different complexities different economic environmental factors and different ownership uh, characteristics and human behaviors. So that's important to keep in mind. In what I would call the initial phase or curiosity or exploratory phase, 
this is where we discuss a strong footing on what drives value um, and then a little bit more on who would purchase the company. And then also, you know, we want to always keep in mind what are the right strategic decisions with respect to estate planning that you should be monitoring. And finally, how long does it take? Well, this is a question that will come up almost all the time. Uh, we will address this more towards the latter part of the uh, transaction. So on the next slide, we really go over, I highlight six points on what I'd call value drivers and value detractors. Now, none of these are, are you know, set in stone, but they're just some common themes that occur when, you know, investors are looking at in, that, uh, positives and negatives. Uh, some of the some of the drivers are clean, strong financials and consistent performance, consistent financial performance. Uh, and you know, listen, there's always reasons for certain things that happen, but the limited kind of but fours or this one time occurrence really help drive a value and showing consistency. Uh, having a strong management team in place that's always very critical, and not just relying on one individual, but a a broad team that works together and works well. Uh, diversified long-term customer base so showing that you know if one customer doesn't walk out the door uh, that you know you, the business isn't going nowhere and that's you know I, I mentioned that as a value detractor if one customer is 40 or 50 percent of your revenue there may be a very good reason for that and there may be a way to uh, to put traps in place to continue to get value from that but it does become a concern I talk about supportive bank markets in here a little bit uh, you know, people are going to have to write relatively large checks to buy businesses. So a lot of that financing is driven by uh, bank markets, which not only impact sales of businesses, but really every facet of the company of, of the economy. And you know, a, a perfect example of that is last year during 2020, banks were very hesitant to start making new loans and doing lending, which put a strain on some of the deals getting done. Um, you know, and other things, uh, other small items that people might you know, have considerations around our a lack of strategic in the operation or, you know, limited items for growth. But, you know, these can all be flushed out and are very specific uh, from transaction to transaction. So moving on to the next topic on who will actually buy my company? Like, who is that? Like, it, who is this person out there? How is Saks Capital going to help us get introduced to that person? So when I think about this at a high level, uh, we typically think about this in two different ways, a strategic buyer or a financial buyer. And very simply, a strategic buyer is a company who does what you do. They usually look to do this for n numerous reasons. It could be for product expansion. It could be for entering into new geographies, geographic expansion into territories they're not already in. Uh, it could be for added capabilities, whether that's a service offering, um, a new kind of value add in terms of making uh, making a product a little bit more efficient, or simply they can't grow organically quick enough. And what do I mean by that? Let's say, for example, I have $100 of revenue, my company right now, and I want to grow by $20 next year. But the industry is only growing around 4 to 5%, and it's going to be really difficult to grow at that rate. Uh, it might make a better, it might make more strategic sense for me to, for me to grow via purchase. That's why uh, there are a lot of acquisitions are done by strategics. And just to give you an example of some of these these uh, these larger, well-known um, deals that have gone on, you could think of a strategic as Sprint and T-Mobile, uh, which is you know adding adding geography, adding scope to compete against AT&T and Verizon, Amazon and Whole Foods. That's product expansion and getting more into the retail market by um, by Amazon and Whole Foods, and Exxon and Mobile, which is just uh, really taking over. You know, it's getting into synergies new capabilities and adding a, a ton of growth. On the other hand, we have financials. And by financials, what do I mean? Well, we've re commonly referred to this as private equity, but typically a financial sponsor can be anyone who's either private equity, a family office, or any other unique pocket of money. Uh, unlike strategic, they usually have a fund, a fund parameter and very specific targets or financial parameters in which they invest. Uh, and that might be profitability, revenue growth or some other dynamic uh, they also have what they will call a specific angle and what do i mean by angle that could be an industry focus uh, a like for a certain type of manufacturing or light manufacturing or niche service offering um, it could be growth mode sometimes it could be a turn it could be a turnaround story where they like to invest in companies that have uh, have gotten into a little bit of trouble and they can help with operations 
Um, and some of the more better known companies uh, for private equity and sponsors are KKR, Apollo, or Carl Isle Group, and also several pension funds. The Canadian Pension Fund is a very active, and California Pension Fund is a very active purchaser of US businesses. And now I'll turn it over to Joy to discuss the importance of estate planning prior to a transaction. Thanks so much, Jerome. So once you've decided that you want to sell your business, it's important to look out and think about your other objectives that you might have. Uh, a lot of our clients are looking at this big liquidity event and they get concerned, naturally concerned, about the income tax implications. A huge liquidity event, the sale of a business, is going to generate a very large capital gains or ordinary gains in a lot of circumstances. And in those situations, you really want to be thinking prospectively and be proactive in deciding how you want to handle things. So one of the things, one of the strategies that I really like for a person who is looking to sell their business is before you have that contract for sale, this is really key, before you have a legal obligation to sell the business, you might want to consider a charitable remainder trust strategy. And this strategy is, is great because it accomplishes both, it could accomplish both an estate planning goal and it can also accomplish an income tax goal because it can reduce the overall income tax that will result uh, or it can defer your income tax obligation over a period of time. Uh, so the way that it works is you put interests in your business into this vehicle and then you take back the right to receive an annuity amount which is either based on the value of the uh, assets in the trust at the end of the year or is based on the income that is earned by the trust. And over the years, you will take a little piece of that capital gains from the sale of the business back into your personal 1040. So that's just one opportunity that we bring to the attention of people who are looking to sell their businesses because it is a great strategy to defer that gains uh, and also achieve an income stream uh, for uh, a period of time. Additionally, you might want to be thinking if you're having a liquidity event of various ways that you might benefit future generations of your family. Transferring assets before you actually turn it into cash can make it easier to leverage it out using valuation discounts, which might not be available when we're talking about cold hard cash. Uh, and we're happy to talk with you about all of these opportunities uh, when you're thinking about selling your business. Back to you, Jerome. Thanks, Joy. Appreciate it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, while no two no two sale processes are the same, there are absolutely no two tax situations that are the same. So if you have multiple owners, um, it's really advantageous to get Joy in as soon as possible, especially now with uh, consistently changing political environments. So appreciate that insight. Um, in our next illustrative phase, which I will call the preparatory phase, which is in between you know the initial phase and ready to go launch a sale there's really three thing three key areas that we want to focus on one is strategic positioning of the business what have you done in the past and what should you look to to do future um, tax and then tax strategy uh, and that was steve will go into that and then a little bit on the financial preparation which al will walk us through so on the strategic front which we lay out on the next slide um, there's a few things that are really critical to uh, highlight here. But really, the first thing I want to point out is you know, a lot of times business owners will come and say, I'm getting ready to sell. So now what, time, what kind of things should I be thinking about? What kind of changes should I make? The most important thing I always highlight and can't underestimate enough is never lose focus on what's made you successful up until this point. You've built a, you've likely built the business from scratch or from other some other existing business or some great idea you had, and you've gotten to this point. Uh, and you've been successful for a reason. Let's not lose focus of that. Instead, let's think about ways to enhance and get ready for a potential sale. So again, as I mentioned earlier, consistent and recurring business has strong value. So if there's opportunities to win any of those contracts or any type of business throughout uh, throughout your business selection, having a keen focus on those opportunities are, um, are very critical. Uh, clean and legal partnership agreements. And what I mean by this is 
a lot of times I'll meet with business owners and they'll have phantom agreements or handshake agreements with other partners or stakeholders. Really having these formalized ahead of a business, ahead of a sale makes life a lot easier. Um, it, it, it makes diligence a lot easier. It puts things to paper and it really forces people to strict by, stick by what they've said um, and to create less conflict going forward. Um, you know, profitable business selection, I wanna highlight here because a lot of times, you know, owners will ask, would it be helpful to grow my top line? Um, and I say, depends. If you are growing your top line and it's not profitable, it's break even. If you're just doing it to show a larger number, it might not be worth the resources. However, if you're growing your top line to penetrate a potential customer down the road and it's like this is what i need to do to get in there and then profitability will become come later then that is a, a strategic business decision so these are just things we uh we, we we discuss the next bullet point is not just important for a sale but i just think in general terms of business uh as well and that's continuity making sure that you have that next level management in place uh things can arise uh situations at any time and you know tragedy or or just people leaving. So we, having that next level, level of management in place and not having critical key man risk uh, is very strong for a business. With that being said, most bus, middle market businesses are built on a lot of blood and tear, bloodshed and tears from you know some individuals who help get start. So it's not uncommon to see some key individuals in the business, but working towards mitigating some of those risks is helpful. And then finally, niche offerings or value added services are very nice to have. And if you do something a little bit different than your competitor or for reasons why your clients choose you, a lot of times that will drive a, a premium value in terms of a sale. So if we will discuss what you what you do there and how to best show it. So either if we're showing it properly through your financials or specific reports or other items or ways to grow that business. That's something that we would sit down and speak about and think about that going forward because we would highlight that to potential investors or buyers. And then control over working capital is also very critical, which Al will speak to a little bit in his discussion. But now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to talk about the importance of tax planning. Thank you, Jerome. Um, welcome everybody. Um, as as uh, Jerome mentioned, I'm gonna talk about just some items to consider when uh, when you're selling your business at least at least from the tax perspective uh, from the tax side but i think overall one of the the key tenets of this is that you, you're not operating in a silo it's not just income tax it's not just estate tax it's not just uh you know clean financials and, and on that side of the, the fence as well it's everything kind of looked at together but with that said as far as uh, from tax planning above all else uh, you're going to want to make sure from a compliance perspective that uh, you're filing all your income and sales and use tax returns, or you've identified areas where there may be some exposure so that you're not caught off guard when you're going through a due diligence process. Also, you know, on top of income and sales and use, are you taking care of other transactional taxes in the, in the correct manner? Property, payroll, excise taxes, uh, things of that nature, where there could be some opportunities that you have or, or, or maybe leaving on the table, but at least you're aware of those well before the the sale process takes place and lastly just taking another holistic view of kind of where you stand um top down bottoms up however you want to do it making sure you you've got your your entity structure and organization all your agreements in place as, as jerome was saying it's very important not just to have handshake agreements or agreements on the side really have everything crystallized and papered up so that when you do transition this over to the to the new buyer if that does indeed occur that the, the transition is smooth and then they, they have a smooth landing and, and the, the business can uh, you know maintain continuity and whatnot because the one of the most important things as part of your sale is that the vent that your customers uh, aren't interrupted they're going to expect the same type of service they're not going to really care who the new owners are they're going to want to make sure that they're getting the same product they're getting the same service that they receive pre and post transaction uh, but like i said this is not something you want to do in a silo. So now I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Al, who will talk about the uh, importance of clean financials. Al, take it away. All right. Thank you, Steve. So you're thinking about selling your business and uh, being a uh, an accountant, of course, financials. We love financial statements. And when we're talking about clean financial statements, we're certainly not talking about you know the font or just how they look or the format. We're talking about those numbers that are being reflected 
And what is the messaging that's being conveyed to a potential buyer of your business? And what is the story that those numbers are going to tell? And is it gonna tell a clean story that's very clear to a potential buyer as to what's going on? Or is it going to be a story that is gonna be somewhat muddied with a lot of history and, and skeletons in the closet that, that have remained on the balances? So things like related party transactions. Um, if you have a business, but it is connected to other businesses, perhaps there's real estate involved in a separate entity, or there is just another operating entity that is not being contemplated as part of the sale, but there are significant transactions going back and forth between those entities, you are gonna really wanna make sure that the financial statements clearly identify the scope and the magnitude of those transactions. And perhaps even thinking about preparing a financial statement that carves out those activities so that the financials being presented to a buyer are, are in fact just a very clean picture of the target entity and not combined and co-mingled with other things. Uh, accounts receivable may be an area that tells some of this story and where there, there are some things that need to be cleaned up, related party balances. But in addition to that, you also wanna make sure things like accounts receivable are presented truly on a gap basis. Potential buyers, certainly if it's private equity, that has outside investors to answer to, um, you know, they are focused on and they are driven by gap, um, you know, gap compliance. So you wanna make sure that your accounts receivable is clean. Same thing with your inventory. If you have inventory and you have old stuff, maybe you've provided an allowance, maybe you haven't. And, you know, it can get very, um, it can be very daunting for a business owner who maybe has never had to prepare financial statements before. Many times we see where the target entity is one that really just only really prepared tax returns as part of their reporting requirement because they really didn't have a need to have gap financial statements prepared on a consistent basis. So having a professional help you really scrub the numbers to identify what a potential buyer may be interested in and what they may not be interested in or could cause questions to arise in a deal, you wanna make sure that you've cleaned those up. Um, other areas where that could be a problem, again, especially for companies that have been predominantly tax driven in their reporting, revenue recognition is a big area that a potential buyer, if they are concerned about true gap presentation on revenue recognition, you really need to take a hard look at that and what you are doing. Manufacturers and distributors, if you have things like maintenance agreements on your products or warranties that you sell um, in addition to the products that you sell, you gotta take a hard look at how you're accounting for those items. And why is that important? You know, Going through and looking at these types of assets and liabilities like maintenance agreement liabilities or warranty liabilities, and even just basic cutoff, making sure that everything is complete and in the right period, it gets down to the networking capital. And networking capital is a key concept when these deals are put together. It's a, it's a number that essentially is a net number of the total assets that a potential buyer is going to be purchasing as well as those liabilities that they will assume. And that is essentially the net investment that a potential buyer expects that they're going to have to make in order for a company just to be able to operate. That networking capital is that intrinsic investment in the company that needs to be made just to keep the gears moving. And, and so if there are major adjustments to what would be defined in your agreement as networking capital, those adjustments you know, could go both ways. They could be positive or they very well could be negative uh, when the deal is closed and there is actually a look back cleanup of networking capital. So it's very important that we've got these balances that they are stated uh, fairly and that they are correct so that there's no surprises for both you as the seller and the buyer. Contracts and agreements, 
um, if you have uh, in your business certain types of agreements where maybe you are paying royalties because you are a contract manufacturer or you have the rights for certain uh, premium name brand products, you absolutely want to make sure and look at those agreements, make sure that they are transferable and that you've cleared all the hurdles. Nothing will you know, slow down a deal or, or stop a deal if you're manufacturing for say, you know, DKNY or Ralph Lauren, and then all of a sudden you realize that you can't transfer the rights to produce those products or represent those products to anyone else without prior approval. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you get that those approvals and really button that all down before um, you start going down the road of closing. Um, remember the networking capital, right? Um, and all of these skeletons in the closet, it's all about making sure you've presented a clean, uh, a clean opportunity for the buyer and every dollar of adjustment in networking capital and EBITDA ultimately, you know, impacts that net purchase price. So, and, and it's typically the, per you know, that every dollar that's in there, it's by some multiple. So, it's not just the amounts that are there, it's also what's the multiple impact on the deal. Um, and that's it for me. So I think I'm gonna turn that back over uh, to Jerome. Appreciate it, Al. And again, thank you, Al and Steve, for both highlighting importance of tax and financial structure. Again, that is, uh, as you as can be imagined, a very large area of focus and diligence in a sale because it really tells the picture of a company, not only uh, historically, but also prospectively and what you're actually buying. So having those as accurate as possible uh, prior to launching a sale process is extremely helpful. Um, so now we'll take it to the final stage, the exciting one. We're ready to sell. We've gone through it. We've got our taxes in line. Our, our estate planning is good. Our financials are solid. Um, we have a strong strategic business. Now our key main thoughts in this phase is what does a detailed process timeline look like or sale timeline look like? Um, what employees need to come, what I call under the hood or be involved in a process, uh, which in this involves confidentiality, and what type of tax structuring, not only tax structuring, but other kind of services, real estate and legal should I be thinking about? What will meetings with investors be like? And then some concluding thoughts on uh, the overall presentation. So on the next slide, I lay out a, a, time, a sample timeline of what a standard process could look like. And I'm not gonna walk through every detailed box, but I wanna leave, I wanna put in some, some thoughts right here. Uh, first of all, uh, this shows that the timeline is expansive and the process could take anywhere from at the short end, four months to a year, depending on if there's regulatory approval, if there's areas of full diligence, if there's legal contracts that need to get assigned over as Al previously hinted upon. And at this point, you know, we would look to get actively engaged. And this is when you bring in Saks Capital Advisors to really act as your key advisor while we would be meeting with you and discussing the discussing the transaction for, you know, possibly years before this phase. This is when we're now actively engaged and we will be, for lack of a better word, walking with you hand in hand through this process, um, speaking with each other every night. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of different phases, whether it's due diligence, uh, management presentations, getting together marketing materials, uh, putting putting data requests in, and this is when we'll discuss what are the right what are the right um, confidentiality uh, measures to take in place, and that's in two different phases. One with employees, it is helpful if you have a couple of key employees, especially as you can imagine on the finance side, that what I would call our quote unquote, under the hood and who can help with data and can help uh, really tell the story of the business. And two, confidentiality in terms of who are we going out to? So we protect confidentiality as much as we can, but ultimately for somebody to uh, know what they're buying and, and make an offer, they need to know who they're buying. So are there competitors um, that you would never want knowing this exists? Are there ways to understand a lot of interest, which I often do? of a specific buyer before we show them who we are. So yes, I would sell to them, but if they're not interested, I don't want to tell them. Um, that is a very common item that we go through and do enough to tease out individual uh, buyer's interest before we get in front of them. Um, and then finally, you know, at what point do we, do we start to tell more people such as service providers, whether that's insurance brokers, um, your 
external accountants, whether that's Saks or another party, um, you know, the uh, your other benefit providers, uh, potentially your uh, PEO if you use one. Um, so that's a little bit about our timeline, and just again, it, this will this will have quite overlap um, between phases. So you know, while this is standard and we can walk through high level, it will continue to change. Um, so on the next slide. As previously mentioned, talk about just some other considerations in the process, which uh, Joy, Al, and Steve all hit upon earlier, some of the more important ones, but also legal. Um, it's an onerous legal process, and we'll go through if you have existing attorney relationships, if we should bring on the, a specific, which we recommend a specific uh, lawyer with M&A expertise uh, who will understand different contracts because there will be uh, agreements that need to be that need to be gone through that are quite expansive and take a lot of time and resources. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, management and employees. Real estate's also one uh, that we we get into a lot of discussions about. So, you know, do you own the real estate? Uh, do you want to continue to own the real estate after? Not every investor wants the real estate. Some, uh, most are not real estate investors. They invest in your in your industry, which might not, which is likely not real estate. So, um, is there is there a sale lease back which you could sell to somebody else? Do you want to keep it as an annuity for your for your family uh, over time so it continues to perform as the business pays rent to the new owners uh, from the new owners and other advisors? As I mentioned, uh, there could be some tax ones and some bank real estate, uh, some bank escrow. For different for different reasons, uh, so this is you know we're always thinking about other sales considerations, and again these are discussions that we will be having throughout a sale process to make sure that we are proactive and getting ahead of any anticipated changes or needs, such to make sure that we stay in a uh, focused on a timely manner. And finally, on our final slide, I'd like to just leave you with some concluding thoughts. Um, as we as Todd mentioned when we, he opened the presentation. Selling your business is likely one of the largest professional decisions that you'll ever have to make. And as much preparation and uh, as much preparation and efficiency that we can get done ahead of time will help you walk through an efficient timeline and help you execute uh, on a successful transaction. Uh, you know, oftentimes I'll get the question: Is this the right time to sell? And there are obviously a myriad of factors, and Saks Capital Advisors will help you think about all those different things. So. You know whether it's me advising on the market valuations, uh, joy giving, different estate planning considerations. Steve and Al walking through, you know, kind of tax strategies and financial how your financials are looking right now. Only you will know when it's the right time to sell, and that will likely be not only a professional decision but a very emotional family decision as well. Um, and what what type of considerations we should have. So you know, we'll continually give you advice on on what where we're seeing in the market and what you can expect. But, you know, we, we the ultimate decision has to come from the owner. Um, as I've mentioned multiple times, uh, I can I can't stress enough confidentiality and trust through any process are paramount. We that is one of our largest jobs, if not the largest, is to protect the confidentiality of the sale throughout the process. We don't want anybody to know about the process who doesn't need to know until it until it's the exact perfect time to do so. Um, you know, I mentioned the process will be challenging at times and can be exhausting. We do this for a living, so uh, you know we're used to walking owners through this process. But again, this is a you know if people are writing multi-million dollar checks, there's going to be a lot of diligence being done, um, and it's just a little different. Our owners don't sell businesses for a living; um, they they've been successful in other ways. So we do our best to mitigate uh, the amount of time. I mentioned multiple times that no two processes and sales are alike. Uh, that can't be any more true, and as just you know, living through whether it was the pandemic last year, uh, the recession in 2008, or other challenges that we've had along the road. Uh, you know, the economic conditions, as much as as much of the business, also impact the set, impact different things. Um, and then finally, I want to leave you with one concluding thought: that an initial conversation with Saks Capital Advisors won't cost you a penny. I love what I, I do, as do everybody else on my team. We like learning from entrepreneurs and understanding new business challenges and you know, how you've become successful and learning a little bit about us. So please feel free to reach out um, because the most important thing in a sale is alignment of interest of all parties. And we'd rather be with you sooner rather than later. So again, thank you. Appreciate the time today. I'm gonna to turn it back to Todd. Okay, folks, there's a few questions that came in through the, uh, the chat and I'm just gonna ask the, the team. Um, but the first one, just so that you know, this presentation will be made available to you if you 
signed up today, you will get the um, the video and also the slides will be with the video, obviously. Um, and also, it's typically posted on our website as well. So that's one question just wanted to answer myself. Now, for uh, the other questions that came in, one question came in, is there a difference between selling your business to a private equity company or a competitor compared with selling it to a employee or an employee group? And I'll just throw that out to the group, whoever wants to answer that. The answer is um, yes, uh, most definitely. The um, you know the employee group there's there's positives and negatives to, or positives and considerations to both. In terms of pri private equity and and strategics, you know we highlight a little bit those differences earlier. Um, strategic will likely understand your business a lot more in depth than a uh, potential private equity. Although the private equity will have expertise. But if we separate out that the main question, which is private equity and strategic versus your employees, um, the answer is yes. Again, we can be very helpful in structuring it to get a sale from your employee. Sometimes we'll need a third party, um, a third party debt or financing provider, because a lot of times the challenge is, is I want to sell to my key employees, but they don't have twenty million dollars or thirty million dollars of cash laying around. Uh, so that is something that we work through. It's uh, a transfer of the business. Now the good news on the transfer is the uh, the employees understand the business. Um, they've they've been working with it for a number of years, and it, it it's just a smoother transit. It's a smoother transition, and it gives some of the existing employees a little bit less um, kind of fear that there's going to be wholesale changes, which may or may not happen with new ownership. But um, it is a we do see those situations all the time. Um, you know the the price negotiation. You might want to not take every last penny. From your uh, from your employees, while it might be a little bit friendlier, while from a, a probably when you're selling it to an outside party, you may want to look to maximize a little bit further. So those are situations we see all the time. Um, and I'll I'll pause there and see if anybody else on the team wants to add anything. It's Steve or Al. Okay, I have another question. There's some other questions that came in, but Steve, Al, do you have anything to comment on that? No, I think Jerome covered that well. <clears throat> I think, again, as we were saying before, every situation is a little bit different, and depending upon who you sell to may impact even the type of sale. Is it stock? Is it assets? Is it some sort of hybrid transaction that's treated a little bit differently for book and tax? So there's a, a number of different aspects to consider. Okay, great. This, I think this next question is for Al um, or, or Jerome or whoever else. It's, do you need to have audited financial statements in order to sell your company? Is that a requirement? Yeah, it, it's not a requirement um, unless, unless, of course, that is what the buyer uh, is going to want. Um, it, it's, it's never a requirement. Um, but keep in mind, depending on who the buyer is, if, if it is a company that is a public company, um, it very well may be a requirement. Uh, because again, they're in the public world, so they may may have, you know, as part of their own due diligence requirements, that just may be one of the boxes that they need to check off uh, in proceeding with an acquisition. Um, but it is never, it's not a hard and fast rule that absolutely it must be audited statements. Uh, more often than not, what we're seeing is, you know, a quality of earnings type of engagement. Uh, is something that buyers look for, uh, and they seem to rely on that more than audited financial statements. But again, it, it really just depends on who the buyer is, how large of a deal it is. Um, so there's there's really no hard and fast rule on that. Yeah, but I'll just add on it. Thanks. That sums it up very well. So I would say that every buyer would love to, for everybody to have. Uh, audited financial statements. With that being said, for a, for for a lot of companies at different sizes, it doesn't make financial sense for you to have a full audit. Uh, not only from the external perspective, but the internal controls that you would need. So, as Al mentioned, not having audits is I don't think I've ever seen it be a deal breaker. But what they will what, what companies will do is take you through the quality of earnings process, and this is a high this is a very 
uh, focused and intense financial exercise that will essentially put your company's earnings on a, on a gap or an audited basis, not necessarily with all the controls, but more with accrual accounting and uh, just standard procedures. So that is one of the more, when we speak about the timeline and diligence items, those are, that's why it's helpful to have, you know, certain finance people under the hood. Um, so no, um, it is not a requirement, but you can, but there will still, with that being said, there will still be very, um, a very rigorous, uh, financial review process. There's a uh, follow-up question to that. When, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, would you recommend that the uh, the seller do their own or hire someone to do a, a quality of earnings report before they actually even go out to uh, solicit uh, potential buyers? Yeah, it's so a great question. Sell side, Q of E, I guess, is the question. It's a great question. Um, and I'll give my opinion and let Al answer uh, his opinion. But uh, you know, I think it, it's definitely it's definitely very helpful. Um, it's it gives us a great understanding of where value will be and what the adjustments are. Uh, with that being said, a, a buyer will likely do their own Q of V as well, uh, and likely start with your Q of V uh, from your from the accounting from we choose, um, and then go from there. So it's a very good starting point, and it likely gets a lot of the heavy lifting out of the way and will give us a good sense of where it will come out. I will just kind of caution it to say that the buy, most buyers will likely do their own Q of E and not necessarily just accept a, a sell side Q of E. They'll, they'll diligence it a lot as well. So yes, it is good. It is a little, it is an expense, a real expense, but uh, it is very, I think it is very value add. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Jerome. I think, I think for, for companies that have had audits performed, um it, it's probably less of a requirement to consider a sales side q of e but certainly if a company really has never had gap financial statements put before they've only done tax returns i think it is a worthwhile exercise to go through to identify and have and have the business owner that's considering selling understand what a potential buyer coming in and doing their own due diligence is going to be concerned about and what they're going to consider to be you know those financial adjustments that could impact the overall sale price um a few more questions have come in so just one i think that should be easy to answer what is the range of multiples of ibida you generally see paid for businesses jerome yeah, I mean, that is uh, the value question is very, uh, it's, again, it's very industry specific. It's very, um, you know, it's very, it, it just ranges based on your size, based on a number of parameters. So EBITDA multiples, uh, and then EBITDA is kind of the big, is the big circle item, right? Like what is the actual EBITDA, which is why we need clean financials. So, you know, I don't want to throw a broad, a, a broad range. I mean, some multiples can trade between four and six. Um, others can trade as high as, you know, 15, 16, 18. Uh, some companies might not trade off an EBITDA multiple. If you're a tech business that has annual recurring revenue from a new product offering, uh, you'll trade off over a revenue multiple. So it really just depends. But, you know, again, I would say these are, these are great discussions that we can have. And, uh, you know, we would do, we can do enough research as we work on all industries to get you recent comps, which are where, uh, where multiples have traded in the industry. Um, and we could show you a number of ways that it's not only um, multiple driven, but also some cash flow parameters. So this is, again, a great example of why having an initial discussion with us uh, is not only helpful, but also uh, won't, cost you, won't cost you much. Uh, so appreciate the question. The other question that just came in, there's a, there's a few other questions, guys. One is, um, are there special or additional tax benefits to selling to an ESOP? I'll take that one. Uh, yes, it, and it, it depends to um, when you sell to an ESOP, what type of organization are you? Are you C-Corp, are you an S-Corp? Uh, there, there are certain benefits that are, are available both pre, both pre and post transaction. So the, the answer, the, the short answer is yes, but it really depends on your structure. And that's, that's something that we can help with. Great. Um, is there, I, I guess some, some of the questions that are coming in, does your firm prepare the valuations in-house or do we outsource? 
I think that that's, I mean, Jerome, you want to answer that? Yeah, I do not use an outside valuation firm. Um, you know, they will go through a lot of the same exercises that I would, um, you know, the, the difference is that they will go off of, you know, multiples that are observed in the marketplace um, and then try and give you a range of valuations, which I think is very helpful. And we'll do the same. So that'll be public comp comparables, which are where are public companies trading, right? So if you're just make it up, make something very easy. If you have a company similar to, um, you know, um, Microsoft, uh, and they're a competitor, we would show, you know, different software multiples. Um, and then there's, they'll also do a discounted cash flow, which will be, you know, it's a little detailed now for this discussion, but it's a, it's a revenue stream of your cash flows over a period of time, discounted back on a theoretical uh, discount rate or rate based on uh, a weighted average cost of capital, annual a weighted average cost of capital. Uh, what the, our difference is we'll get a valuation that we think is ex executable. So there might be a number of reasons why certain companies trade in the market, but I'm talking to investors every day, uh, whether that's on the private equity side or strategic side, that I might know of transactions that have happened that don't have publicly announced multiples, but I have a good idea or a whisper what the range is. So when we bring you a range, you know, we'll say what we think is executable and where I think your business will price as opposed to where is a theoretical exercise uh, or an educational exercise, which a lot of the valuation firms do. And I'm not taking anything away from what they do. I think it's, I think what they do is very accurate and likely we could come out with a very similar exercise. Um, we just try and present a range of values. What's, um, you know, what is uh, executable. And again, because a lot of things that aren't in the multiples are, are, you know, what kind of customer concentration did the person have? Was there a key man risk? Is there any kind of operating special sauce that one company had? Uh, if you look at a range of just, you know, uh, of different service providers or, you know, different comps, they'll all trade at different multiples. And there's usually a very good reason. So taking an average of them and applying it to your company can, uh, can be very positive, but it can also be negative. We want to kind of understand who you look the most like, what kind of M&A transactions are there, you know, what kind of expenses do you have? What kind of value would somebody have? So yes, we we work through the valuation, prepare that what we think is executable for for in in house. Great. So um, Jerome, I think that we're going to wrap it up here. There are a few other questions that I think we could take offline because they're very specific. And uh, folks, there if you see the slide right here, there's our uh, email addresses for you to contact us. And uh, you will be getting a copy of the presentation that we are presenting today. But thank you so much. Um, please check out our website um, of Sachs Capital Advisors and wishing you all a great day.